Hello, today we're continuing in our series on GCSE physics revision, looking at rectifiers and capacitors. Many devices in the house require direct current. For example, computers need a pretty constant supply of voltage. An alternating voltage is no good to them at all. It causes all sorts of problems. So we have to take the alternating voltage or alternating current that is coming in through your domestic supply and we have to produce from that as close as possible to a direct current that is flat and comparable to the voltage that you would get from a battery. Incidentally we would almost certainly have to transform the voltage from 230 volts to whatever your computer supply was which is say 12 volts or 9 volts or if you're charging your mobile phone similarly but that can be done with the transformer and we've already dealt with that. The real question for this video is how are we going to take an alternating voltage and produce a direct and steady voltage? Well, the first device we're going to need is a diode, which is sometimes represented in a circuit, a circuit like this and sometimes without the circle. Both of these represent a device called a diode. I'll tell you what that is in a moment. But the essential feature of a diode is it only allows current to flow in one direction. And that is the direction of the, if you look, there's a kind of an arrow here. Here's the point, this is the point of the arrow and it's the direction of the arrow that determines the direction of the current. No current can flow in the opposite direction. To all intents and purposes, the resistance of a diode in the wrong direction is infinite. It does not allow a current to flow. How do they work? Well, it's all based on things called semiconductors. You'll recall that I said that there were three types of material. There were conductors, which have lots of free electrons and therefore allow electricity to flow. There are insulators, which have hardly any free electrons and therefore do not allow a current to flow. And then you have these things called semiconductors, which have a small amount of free electrons and therefore allow a very small current to flow, but nothing like. Um, the strength of a conductor. Now let's take a semiconductor and the one that is typically taken is a substance called silicon. Silicon is a semiconductor, it has some free electrons but very small currents would flow. But what you can do with silicon, what the technologists and engineers have found, is that you can take one atom per million so just one in a million silicon atoms and replace it with a different atom. So just one in a million silicon atoms are replaced. You could replace one in a million with phosphorus. Now the point about phosphorus is it has slightly more electrons in its outer shell than silicon does. So if one atom in every million of silicon is replaced with phosphorus, there are slightly more electrons in this substance than there would have been in pure silicon. In other words, it's slightly more negatively charged and for that reason, we call it N-type. The phosphorus replacement is called doping. And so if you dope silicon with phosphorus, which just means you replace about one atom per million, with phosphorus. Don't ask me how you do it, that's for engineers. But you replace one part per million with phosphorus, you get a slight excess of electrons, slight excess negative charge, that's called n-type. On the other hand, you could replace one part per million of silicon with aluminium. Now if you do that, aluminium has slightly fewer electrons in its outer shell than silicon, so there's as it were a deficit of electrons compared to what there would be in pure silicon. If there's a deficit of electrons, then that means it is relatively positively charged. And that's called p-type because there's a deficit. Here there's a slight surplus of electrons, here there's a deficit of electrons. Now what happens if you bring those two types together? I mean physically locate them next to one another. So this is p-type and this is n-type. Well, the first thing that happens is that some of the free electrons near the edge, 
will as it were compensate for the deficit of electrons near the edge of the p-type. So in a very small region between the two there becomes a region which has neither spare electrons nor an electron deficit. In other words as it were no available free electrons at all. So now what you want to do is to say what happens if I put a battery across this device such that the positive end of the battery is connected to the p-type and the negative energy uh, sorry the negative end of the battery is connected to the n-type. What happens? So there we are there's the wires connecting them. Well the spare electrons are in here and of course the electron supply is coming from this end of the battery because electrons flow from negative to positive and there is a positive as it were attractive point of the battery here. All the electrons want to flow here and they have no problem about crossing no man's land if you like. All these electrons will readily flood across firstly this area where there's no free electrons and then across the area where there's a deficit of electrons and as they flow more and more electrons will replace them coming from the battery itself. So there's a, a huge incentive to get across here because this is relatively positively charged. All the electrons want to get to the positive charge. So in that direction a current will flow. But what happens if we take the same PN type with our region in the middle which is as it were no free electrons. This is still P, this is still N, but we put the battery the other way around now. Electrons will always want to get to the positive charge. So the free electrons here are happy enough to go to the positive charge. But then what? You haven't got any free electrons in this bit of the device to flow. There is, as it were, an, uh, something that will restrict or impede any further electron flow because there are no free electrons to flow. So when you try and get a current to flow in that direction, it won't. And that's the principle of a diode. In this direction, it flows. In this direction, the current does not flow. So now using a diode, or actually four diodes, we can produce what we call a rectifier. So here is my AC current coming out of the wall, and I'm going to create a kind of diamond device, or diamond-shaped wire. And the way to remember this is all the diodes, as it were, point upwards. So diode there, diode there, diode there, diode there. And you notice that they are all generally pointing upwards. The current flows in the upward direction, but it doesn't flow in the downward direction. And then we take an output at the top here. We take an output at the bottom here, and we just connect this here. And this is now going to be our output voltage, which we hope will be in one direction only. So let's think about it. When the, this, this current is going to, of course, flow 50 times a second, first in this direction, then in this direction, then in this direction, then in this direction. When it flows in this direction, let's see what happens. It comes along here till it gets here. It cannot go downwards because it would be going against the diode, so it's not allowed. It has to go through this diode the right way. It can't go down here because it's against the diode, it's not allowed, and so it comes out here. What happens when the current goes this way? Well, it comes around here, around here, around here, up to here. It cannot go downwards because it would be going against the diode. It must go upwards. When it gets to here, it cannot go downwards because it's going against the diode. It must go this way. And so what you find is no matter when the current is going in that direction or when the current is going that direction, in both cases, they come out of this top wire. We set the bottom wire at naught volts and consequently, you've now got a voltage which, uh, which simply um, increases and decreases, but always in the same direction. So that instead of having an alternating voltage which goes positive and negative, you now have a voltage which goes sort of like this. So it never goes negative, it never goes the wrong way. It is still going up and down, so we're not out of the woods yet. Computers don't like that any more than they don't like this. 
but we're halfway there. We've got what is called a rectified voltage, a rectified current, where the, as it were, the polarity or the direction of the voltage is always in one direction only. It's never negative. But to understand how we're going to smooth out those variations, we need to introduce a new device called a capacitor. A capacitor is typically two parallel plates very close together. So here are my, as it were, two parallel plates. They have a cross-sectional area A and the distance between them is D. The critical thing is, of course, that they mustn't touch. And to that end, quite often people put a very small piece of insulating material between the two metal plates. This means that no current can flow between the plates. And that is critical to understanding a capacitor. Never, never, never does any current ever flow between the plates. The amount of capacitance that you get is proportional to the area. So the bigger the area, the greater the capacitor's value. And it's also proportional to one over the distance between the two plates. So as the distance decreases, the capacitance increases. So now let's think about how a capacitor works. Well, here's my capacitor. I'm just drawing the two plates and you're looking end on. There they are. Very likely they have insulating material between them. And we simply put a battery across the plates. Now, what is actually going to happen? Electrons flow. Whenever a current flows, electrons flow. Electrons flow from minus to plus. So the electrons will flow this way round the circuit, except once they get to this plate here, there's no further place to go. It's like they've come to the end, uh, they come to a river and there's no way across. They get as far as here, they'd like to go all the way round to the positive end of the battery, but they're stuck. They cannot get across that gap. No current flows. So the electrons can only build up on the plate. And that's exactly what they do. You get a build up of negative electron charge on that plate. But what does uh, an, a large built up negative charge do? Well, remember, like charges repel. There will be free electrons on this plate because this is metal. Metal has free electrons. You've got a large number of electrons built up on this one, like charges repel. So these charges here will repel the electrons that are on this plate and send them round to the positive end of the battery. And that will leave positively charged atoms because the electrons have been driven off. And so you've now got a capacitor that's got a large negative charge on one side and a large positive charge on the other. And I'll say it again, at no time did ever any electrons jump across the gap. This is purely induction. The electrons on this side have, by Coulomb's law, essentially the force that repels electrons, two light charges repel. The electrons in this side have, have repelled the electrons on this side, leaving a net positive charge. And that will continue to happen until, if this is the voltage across the battery, until the voltage across the capacitor, measured on a voltmeter, also equals V. And when that is the case, the capacitor is fully charged and no more uh, charges will form on the plates. If you were to monitor how the charge or the voltage on the capacitor builds up over time, if you plot voltage against time whilst you're charging the a capacitor, what you find is it looks like this. So as time goes by, the extent to which the voltage increases is reducing all the time until you get to a certain point when the capacitor is charged, that would be about here. And then no matter how long you leave it, the voltage doesn't increase. It's reached its, fix, it's, reached its maximum value and that will be the voltage of the battery. What you can do with that uh, capacitor, well, several things you can do with it. For example, you can disconnect the battery, in which case the capacitor remains fully charged because there's no way it can currently discharge because to do that, um, the electrons would have to jump across the gap and they can't do it. But what you could do then is to connect this capacitor 
to, let's say, the flashlight in a camera. Now, these electrons can zip round and, as it were, neutralise the positive charges, which is what they'd like to do. They're attracted to the positive charge. And in doing so, all this charge flows through the lamp. Remember, a flowing charge is a current. So you get quite a big current potentially going through this lamp. It makes a big flash. And that is one of the ways in which camera flashes operate. If you were to plot the discharge, in other words, this voltage is now going to, this voltage across the capacitor will decrease as you discharge the capacitor. Then what you would see is that if you plot voltage against time, you would see that the discharge looks like this until eventually it gets down to zero. So charging a capacitor has this kind of shape, voltage against time. Discharging a capacitor has this kind of shape, voltage against time. So how's that going to help our problem? You remember the story so far, we've taken alternating current from the wall. We've probably put it through a transformer so it's now at a smaller voltage, say 12 volts, but still alternating. We put it through the rectifier, which I described earlier, and that has simply meant that everything is on one side of the line. It's all, as it were, positive. Nothing ever falls into the negative domain. But what we want is as close to possible to a straight line output voltage. How are we going to do that? Well, if you remember the output that we had from the rectifier, I won't redraw the rectifier, but there was an output voltage, which we called VO, and that looked like this, which was no good at all. Um, and if we simply fed that to the computer, the computer would quickly get very unhappy. But here's the trick. If you put a capacitor across, then what's going to happen? Well, as this voltage builds up, the capacitor will charge. So you will now get a charged capacitor. As this bit would fall, so that's what it would do, what happens is the capacitor begins to discharge and effectively maintains the voltage. It drops a tiny bit, but it kind of maintains the voltage. Even though the output voltage here is falling, the charged capacitor maintains the level of the voltage until this comes back up again. And when it does, the capacitor is recharged. And then as this wave would go down like this, the capacitor holds it at a pretty steady voltage until this comes up and now the capacitor recharges. And now the output voltage would fall to zero, but the capacitor maintains the voltage because this is, this is charged, this has got a voltage across it, this is contributing to the output voltage, and so on and so forth. So instead of getting an output voltage that looks like this, which would be no good for computers, what you end up with is this, which is still, as I've drawn it, not ideal. That's quite a lot of wobble there in the voltage and computers might, might uh, not be very happy. But obviously what you do is you pick a capacitor of such size that this degree of wobble is very, very small at all. It's very, very small and well within the tolerance that the computer can um, put up with. That's called smoothing. So to summarize, we take a transformer, which will reduce the um, socket at the wall, 230 volts to, two, to maybe 12 volts AC. We put it through a rectifier made of four diodes that takes the 12 volts AC and produces a variable voltage, but one that no longer goes negative. And then finally, we use the capacitor to smooth out these variations and produce a near enough direct current and certainly one that our computers will put up with.